All right. Welcome to The Buff Show. Today, we're going to kind of go over how to be competitive in the multiple offer situation as a buyer. It's been a while since we've needed that, but I, the market's warming up, and I think you're going to see it on some hot properties. And when someone throws a crazy deal out there, I think we're going to you need to be ready. Yeah. Well, I just ran into one that we lost out on, and I know Kate and Michaela did in their office, so they're out there. They're less common, but this just is, is an episode if you're a buyer. I mean, that most buyers should listen to this just to know how to be competitive because it's never like, like it, it seems like you don't find out you're in a multiple offer situation until it's too late, right. kind of, you know? And there's things that people can do to kind of plan ahead and be more competitive right out of the gate. So well, it almost prepared is competitive, right? you know, at this point in, in this market. Yeah. So we have 10 tips for buyers on how to be more competitive, how to make your offer more appealing and how to hopefully lock down more deals in this market, yep. in any market, like like in, in an up, down, sideways market, there's always gonna be competitive situations that you're gonna have to know how to get through those, so. Well, and not even in multiple, I mean, this is for multiple offer, but it's being competitive in general. You know, sometimes you have a tough seller mm -hmm. that they're being real picky and choosy, but if you come in and you're shining like a diamond, right? They're sometimes they'll take a lower offer yeah. if they know you're a solid candidate. So how, how to shine like a diamond. Shine like a diamond. <laughs> I, copyrighted, I'm not, I didn't steal that. As a buyer, I like yeah. that. Okay, so the first thing, Ben, what would you what okay. would you say? This is my now has become my biggest pet peeve. Slash, get a pre-approved letter. Actually, talk with your lender. Know where you're at. Get pre-qualified, pre-approved. Actually, start the process. Right. I mean, I wouldn't say this is for everybody. If you know you're going to buy a house, you need to do this. You need to fill out the application. You need to. I used to tell people. And I still do sometimes, depending on the situation, talk to Leonard, just see where you're at, get that feel. But when you make that decision, like, hey, we're going to be buying a home, mm -hmm. start the loan application. Yeah. Get ready to go. Get, get, your, yeah. get your finances in order. It, yeah. it takes months to get ready. Like, you got to save up a down payment. Like, mm -hmm. it, be prepared and get the freaking pre-approval letter, not a pre-qualification letter, because there's a difference. Yeah, I, I could write a pre <laughs> qualification letter you know they they don't those are and that as a seller if you see a pre-qual letter me as an agent i'm like well he's not not pre-approved he basically just called his bank and stated his income and there's yeah. you know so if he's telling the truth yeah but if he's already been pre-approved i know he started the process they pulled his credit yep they've started looking in the background there's no deep darks that are going to jump mm -hmm. out and you know derail this this deal a month down the road and yeah in kind of a hot slash competitive market, you really look at that as an agent to advise your seller, mm -hmm. hey, look, they really haven't done, they don't even have a pre-approved, they haven't even talked to a lender. Do we really want to lock up your property mm -hmm. in a, an ever-growing, ever-warming market? So yeah. big thing for me is pre-approve a letter. If you can get that, that's a huge step forward. Yeah, that's going to give the lender confidence in you because they know what they're dealing with with you it's going to give the agent confidence and like hey these buyers are right. rocking and rolling ready to go so get that get the pre-approval letter and you're you're already ahead of a lot of your competition right. and with that that makes it really easy you can actually have your lender call their agent and ooh and goo goo you like mm -hmm. that is a huge when you have a lender call you mm -hmm. to tell you how solid someone is like that gives you all the confidence in the world to lock up someone's right which is another one of our points so the second point is knowing the offer price that you want to go in at if it's highly competitive and they have multiple offers you know let's say they listed this profit property for five hundred thousand, and they have five six seven eight offers there's a chance it's going to go above asking mm -hmm. like just know like oh, the, how many times you get hey ben i really want this property I want the house, but I want to pay X. It's for 500,000, I want to pay 450. And you're like, dude, you're not like, there's no chance. So the biggest thing is, is knowing the price and, and not having, you know, we just ran into this situation on a property where it was listed and they listed it under value in my opinion. And it was hard getting my clients off of the fence of, well, there's off, there's asking price and there's market value. And knowing the difference 
Like if the house next door, they list it for 300,000, but it's worth 400,000 because that's what the last three comps in the mm -hmm. neighborhood sold for. But you're a buyer and you feel weird about paying above asking, even though asking price isn't market price and people get that mixed up so much. So even if you paid 350 for that house, you're still $50,000 ahead because you, you know, the house is actually worth four. So knowing the difference between the offer price and the market value price. And a lot of times, if there's something that you really want and they've marketed it right, and it's, you know, it's been presented to everybody out there, you're going to have to pay fair market value. Right. You're going to have to pony up and come yep. up with the, the money. And that is sometimes a, a strategy with sellers. They'll they'll price just below market value on a really hot commodity home or, or piece of property. And it will cause that frenzy because you'll see agents out there, actually good agents, explaining the value to their clients. Right. Which causes like this multiple offer situation. So, yeah. I mean, knowing the price and the market value and coming up with a good number and being educated on the market. So, you know, what offer to offer, sure. what price to offer. And that, and that goes along with knowing what you can offer. Right. Right. It's, it's easy to get stuck and die on that molehill of not overpaying, even though you're underpaying. You don't get stuck on the offer price mm -hmm. or on the, the list price. Right. Okay. Another big one. Time is of the essence. And then this starts from the day we first meet to the day we close, right? When you get into these tough situations with the multiple offer situation or just in general, right? I had an, I had an experience where a client, very well qualified house was paid off. We were buying a million dollar home and they were just hum hawing on, oh, what should we do? What should we do? it? And they finally decided to finally do it. And then they took three days to sign the documents. Well, in that three days of signing the offer stuff, just because they'll get around to it, two other offers came in. And in part, me, I should have pushed them harder. But they said, hey, if you guys would have had this to us a week ago when we started talking, we would have, we would have been under contract a few hundred grand less than what they got. Oh, geez. You know, so time is of the essence. When you're ready to go, talk to your agents, study, and go. Don't yeah. hum ha. Right. You know, get it under contract. That's when you're actually supposed to actually do more hum hawing. If you know you want the property, get under it. That's why you have a financing appraisal and a due diligence. Yeah. But no, I've I've seen it. And and there's so much psychology behind like negotiations and buying. Mm -hmm. Like in the beginning, if you see a property, there's no offers, it was just listed. Like people are like, oh, I got all the time in the yeah, world. Or let's let's see how Let, long. Let's yeah. see how it goes, mm -hmm. and then they get an offer, and then you're like, oh shoot, somebody else wants it, and instantly you're willing to pay more, you know. Yep. And it's just like it is a weird psychology and dynamic. So, and, and again, learn from others' mistakes. If you like a property, keep it get, going, yeah, right? Yep. Get going. Let us know. And and here's what happens to us a lot of times. We go out, we show properties, we get the clients a CMA report, tells them where the value is, and we kind of talk about it. And and then they get back to us, you know, 24, 48 hours later. And then oftentimes, like, it's like when they get home after work, they talk and it's like a text at nine or a text or a call at yeah. nine or nine or 10 at night. And they're like, hey, we want to put an offer in. And then on our end, it's like, are we really like going to, take time out of sleeping and stuff and have to draft up an offer. It's just like, if you can let us know as soon as possible, as quick as possible, we'll get that drafted up and keep the ball rolling and being aware of our time and our, our lifestyle and stuff. So we're not burning the candle at both ends. We will, but it's not enjoyable for us. Right. Right. And you can just keep it moving quick. Like if you like it, let's get an offer and let's get it, right. get it, get it going because there, there's time. To, the biggest thing I like to tell people, there is time to think during the process. Yeah. We have built in dates for that. If we show it, you like it, let's go. Right. And I like that. The biggest thing with everything's electronic nowadays, right? Mm -hmm. You can sign on your phones. You can sign. If, if we send you a document too, if you say, Hey, let's do this. And we burn the candle that night and, and get stuff. Don't let it sit in your inbox for two days because right. that's just time ticking away. Which happens. A it fair does amount. happen. So. And so time is of the essence. And you got to keep in mind, once you get the offer over to the sellers, well, then they have to have, they have an acceptance period mm -hmm. of when they could accept or counter. And so you got to get that over to them 
just like your client situation. Yep. It's happened so many times to me where we waited f around for a few days. And if we would have just been like Johnny quick, on the spot. Yeah. And then if you're Johnny on the spot and you do it quickly, that goes to show to the sellers, wow, these guys came through it. They must really like it. They're quick. They're executing. They're pre-approved. They're pre-approved. Let's Not do pre it. Qualified. Yeah. Pre-approved. Yeah. They're they're ready to go. So that okay. is time of the is of the essence. Through the whole thing. You yeah. know, addendums, offers, the whole thing. Okay. So we're pre-approved. We know what the heck we're doing. We know the offer price. We know all that. The next step is we get into the contract part of things. How do we make these contracts stand out? If we know we're we're up batting against three, four other people, how do we make this stuff stand out? The biggest one and probably the most scary, but also the most, I think heavy hitting in part of a contract is earnest money. Mm -hmm. And you can do tons of stuff with earnest money. You can offer more than that, you know, your average five, ten thousand $10,000. You can make earnest money go hard. You can do different things like that. Once again, this is where you need to be prepared and know what you do and don't want. Yeah. Because once you start locking that stuff down, if you know you want the house and you love it, you don't care to lock down that five, ten thousand $10,000 because you know you're going to get the house. Yeah. So we should define what earnest money is in case somebody's oh, wondering. Cool. Earnest money is basically money that you put down with the contract that's consideration. Like, hey, we're interested in buying the property. If we stick to these dates, this earnest money goes towards our down payment, towards the, the, the house. But mm -hmm. if we breach the contract or break any of these deadlines that we've set forth, then you, Mr. Seller, can take our earnest money as liquidated damages, uh, lost time, et cetera. I mean, or if they don't take your earnest money, they could sue you. So contracts are, I mean, you're signing a, a legal document that they can enforce legally. And earnest money is another component to that that binds both the buyer and seller mm -hmm. if either party breaches. A remedy is need, needed. It's yeah. like a preloaded pill. Yep. And, and the brokerages typically just hold the earnest money in a trust account. And then at closing, it's just wired to the title company and taken out of the proceeds and goes towards your down payment of the loan. But if you breach the contract, then your earnest money is gone. So typically we see earnest money uh, equal to about 1% of the, the purchase price. So on a $500,000 house, you're about five grand, mm -hmm. right? I've seen earnest money up to, you know, a hundred grand. Like it just depends on the property. And how aggressive someone's being. Right. Yep. And so the more earnest money you put down, the sellers are going to be like, oh, these guys are pretty serious. They're putting a large Their chunk consideration down. is yeah. higher. Yeah. Right. Even though the earnest money is contingent upon some of these deadlines, right? And like Ben was talking, there's more things that we can do with the earnest money, which we'll get into. But just keep in mind, having more earnest money not only ties you to the seller, but the seller to you. What if the seller gets an offer for a hundred grand more, you know, a few days into the deal and you only put it down a thousand dollars earnest money, they could be like, hey, here's a thousand bucks. I'm breaching our contract. I'm going with this other offer. Right. I've never seen that happen. Usually because you could, you know, you get sued real easy you if could, you yeah. breach on the seller side. You could get sued. The seller could get sued, but it, it ties both parties to each other. So right. having a good chunk of earnest money. And I, I think in the five to $50,000 range is good for most properties. Oh, yeah. So it, and it, like I said, it really depends on how heated the property is. Right. So that being said, I do an over earnest money. And then you talked about hitting those deadlines. What are some of those deadlines? So number five would be making sure we have tight deadlines. So in a, in a contract, you have your due diligence deadline, your financing deadline, and your appraisal deadline. And a lot of times your financing and appraisal deadline are One tied, the same. Yeah, tied together. So your due diligence deadline, again, normally we see about a two week period here, but sometimes you can get that done in, in, in a week, you yeah. know, or a couple of days. It just depends on how much you want to do during that due diligence process. If you've already done a lot of the due diligence work up front, mm -hmm. then like that's going to shorten up that date. I've even had clients do a home inspection before a house was under contract. Like they took that risk. Right. Well, and, and a lot of clients that I've worked with, they either have a friend that's an inspector or whatnot, and they'll do as much as I can during a showing. Right. Like they know they love the area and they love the house. Right. You know, they, they can tell they like it. So the first yeah. thing they're looking at is, is there any defects in this property yeah. that are big enough? 
just scared me away. Right. And they're doing that during the showing. Right. And we try and do that with our clients. You were an electrician before I framed houses. We're pointing out things like we, when we make an offer on a house, we're already taking into consideration, oh, this is the condition, it has these things, right. it's going to need a new roof, the furnace is garbage or whatever. But, but doing your due diligence up front, and this kind of goes back to the time part. If you're thinking ahead, like, hey, we like this house, we might want to make an offer. Do your your homework up front and then you can really tighten those dates up mm -hmm. because if a seller is dealing with an offer that if they're equal in terms, say 500,000, 500,000, but one client has a five day due diligence period and the other one has a 14 day due diligence period, that five day -er is going to look a lot more mm -hmm. enticing because during due diligence, a, a buyer can pull the plug back out and get all their earnest money for any back. material reason. Yep. yep. And, and. And then the sellers, you know, going back to market would just, and they wasted some time. You right. Know? And, it, and it's hard. It doesn't look good going back on market because the first thing people see when it comes back, hey, why did you go under contract and yeah. drop out? And then going into financing. So typically you're financing an appraisal deadline is is four weeks, like another two weeks after due diligence. Due diligence. And there's a lot of buyers, if they were, again, pre-approved from the beginning, mm -hmm. All their tax documents are, are to the lender. They've already pulled their dot or pulled the credit. And the lender really has a good idea of what mm -hmm. needs to be done there. Then all they well, need to do is order the appraisal, which, which yep. an appraisal we can get done in like a week or two. Mm -hmm. And well, so, and lenders nowadays will actually pre-send you into underwriting. Yeah. So the second you have a contract, they will, they will underwrite it in-house with an underwriter and then they'll know if there's anything. So there'll be no worry when they send it to a federal underwriter or anybody right. else that has to underwrite that loan. Yeah. So it just cuts time off, gives that reassurance, that security and, think, and a is able to cut your deadlines because you're not worried about that last second surprise of, Oh, I've got a credit card. In my, I didn't know about, or, you know, I opened an RC Willie's account without telling mm -hmm. my wife or something. Yeah. You know? So tight deadlines, that'll, that'll get you ahead. A lot of the time, like if you can't compete on price, if you can't compete on er earnest money, just having tight deadlines and all your ducks in a row can make you stand out oh, yeah. in front of the competition. So here's here's another thing I want to point out. We're talking if you're in a multiple offer situation, all of this stuff, whether you're the only person offering or multiple offer, this is just how to be a good buyer how you can be competitive and you're not groveling at the hands right. of a seller, right? Right. You're coming in, bringing value to that seller. That seller sees you and wants to use you as his buyer. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it's not just for multiple offer. Yeah. It's how you look good in general. Right. Because if you're if you're making an offer, this is a place you want to raise your family, live in, like call it your, your home. And you ought to take that serious, right? Yep. Yep. And, and most people are just like, oh, I think I should buy a house. And then have you talked to a lender? No. Yep. And it's just like, okay, we're doing this all backwards and we've been through the rodeo a bunch of times. Let's not make it a rodeo. You And, and it sucks because a lot of people are going to look at this and hear this and go, oh yeah, well, you, it's just, you agents always say that. Right. Wait until you fall in love with a house and you lose it because you, you were ready. three days not ready. <laughs> yeah. You know, and then your wife's looking at you or you're looking at your wife going, I'm going to shake you or, yeah. because all you had to do was call that lender that week instead of, you know, Bump it on the couch or whatnot. Just be ready. Mm -hmm. If you're gonna do it, do it. If you're not gonna do it and you're just fairy tale looking, that's fine. Go fairy tale look. But when you're ready, be prepared. Call you're us. Ready. We'll help you get prepared. Right. You know. Yeah. Yep. You you will you'll save more time and money and heartache being prepared than than trying to do it backwards. So And I, I think that falls into our number six is making sure you have a right team in place. Mm -hmm. This is where I'm gonna plug in the use us as realtors, right? <laughs> If, if you don't have a realtor that is honest with you and just honestly a no bullshit, hey, no, I'm not going to go show you this house because you're not ready. Right. Like, get ready. And then let's go look at 40 houses. Right. Because they know what, what happens out there. And the, I would almost say tragedies when you lose a house for something so simple. Right. Lender too. You got to have a good lender that's, mm -hmm. that's going to respond to you when you text them, when you call them. When I text them, when I call your lender to double verify stuff when we're doing these contracts, the team behind you mm -hmm. and you're part of that team as a seller or a buyer. Mm -hmm. You've got to be as good as we are and we're going to push you to do that. Mm -hmm. No, I like that. Yeah. And, and the team having the right team in place, whenever I send over an offer, I'm calling the other agent. Mm -hmm. I'm saying, Hey, 
you know, I've done all these deals. I'm not, this isn't my first rodeo, right? Right. I've, I've gotten hundreds of transactions across the finish line. And I think that gives them confidence in us as well. Like, Hey, I, I've worked with Ben in the past, you know, I've, I've ran, I've ran into him. Like we have a good reputation and there's a lot of agents, lenders, and other people out there that just, you, you, you see him coming and you're like, oh man. This if, is going to be a rodeo. Yeah. No. Yeah. And so we work really hard to protect that reputation because if we have deals go south because of a buyer or a seller, like that affects us because mm -hmm. we were representing that party. And so we work really hard to protect our reputation and make sure not that deals like it, it happens sometimes and it's yeah. out of our control, but we're not out there, you know, trying to make it a mess for other, other buyers and sellers are out there. And I've had bad experiences with some agents where I'm just like, really? Like, this is just not a, a, yep. a professional yeah. well, and endeavor. You've seen, I, you've seen it. You've listed at home. You've had identical or really close identical offers come through. Mm -hmm. And whether you knew the agents or not, just the small interactions from the start, you, you tell your clients like, Hey, she's called every day and checked on us mm -hmm. and she's sent pre-approval letters and she had her lender call. Mm -hmm. And then you have that other agent that doesn't you know, even text. Yeah. You. doesn't even yeah. text you or they misspelled the seller's name right. on the contract or yeah. something weird like that. And they mm -hmm. just hard to work with. And yeah, it, and it gets dangerous because if you have something that, that doesn't get filled out properly or whatnot, it looks bad. It looks bad mm -hmm. coming to you. And then you have to get that fixed going back. You might be missing deadlines. Mm -hmm. It's a team is worth its weight in gold. Yeah. And, and lender. And, and again, it goes back to, if you're not ready, we can't vouch for you. Like if you have that pre-approval and all your ducks in a row, we can go to bat for you. We have we can, ammo to negotiate. We, we can fight. Mm -hmm. But if, if you don't, we're just like, please, we're guessing. Like, please accept our offer. <laughs> yeah. We, we have no ammo. Yeah. We have no ammo. Yep. So give us some ammo and we can, we can make some stuff happen for you. I'm going to get into number seven. So, and this, this comes down to your agent and the lender and your team, just knowing what the seller's needs are. I always, on every deal, I'm talking with the other agent. What do they need? Why are they moving? Where are they going? What's mm -hmm. their motivations for this deal? Because if we know their motivations, we can like create this perfect package that looks amazing to them. You know, right. a quick close to one seller could be like an insult to another seller. Like, right. you want me out of the house in two weeks? I don't even yeah. know where I'm going, you know? My my famous line is I always call and say, hey, if you were to put these in order, what's most important to you? Your timeline, mm -hmm. your price, or your due diligence. Right. And and you'll really get a lot. And sometimes their agents don't know where they'll have to ask. But if they tell you like, hey, my timeline's more important, sometimes you can get a way better deal by extending a month or being a two week close, or, mm -hmm. you know, if you can give them a free month lease back, you could save 10, 20, 30, you know, tons of money. Right. Yeah. Because just by presenting the right offer. Yes. Be presenting what they needed. Right. Instead of having to wait for them to counter with it or beg for it or ask back, or, you know, if you know what they want when you go in. So yeah, knowing your sellers as a buyer is huge. Okay. So some ideas I wrote down were just flexible close date. Hey, we can close anytime during the month of June. You know, you give us a week notice and yeah. we'll set the settlement date and we'll close, you know, mm -hmm. or Hey, lease back, we'll get this closed up. You can stay there for an extra month on us. Yeah. Moving out an extra month to move. Yeah. I, I would give a million dollars for that. Or Hey, that barn or that shed in the back has a lot of garbage and stuff in there. Don't worry about it. We'll take care of it. You know, oh, being yeah. flexible and stuff like that. That one is huge, especially yeah. in your rural areas. That, right. Like I don't have to go and clean all that trash or the old trucks and stuff in the backyard that yeah. they inherited from the buyer before them. Mm -hmm. And yeah, huge. One other thing I want to point out is probably 80% of homes that we tour nowadays have cameras in them. Mm. Ring, <laughs> ring yeah. doorbells, cameras inside, baby monitors, and just stuff that you might not even know that are around. And if you say any comment or weird thing inside of a house towards the sellers or point out something quirky or whatever, like you're shooting yourself in the foot. Be yep. be respectful. I would say a next step, not even respectful. Like, for example, we have one, the the seller or the potential buyer said, oh, this lot situated a little bit, the house situated a little weird on the lot. Not an insult. Very, and it is. It's a little bit different. Kind of a big lot, but... It was a put off to my my sellers. They're like, "Yeah, we heard them on the ring camera." Right after I just sent them the 
the, the review, offer. the no, the review forms. Oh, and they were. I wouldn't have thought it was a turn off. Right. You know them saying it, but when you're in a home, less just. You know what? I like this. I like that, and leave it at that, and then discuss at the car. Right. Discuss at home. Call each other on your drives home. Yeah. People always want to try and uh, negotiate in the negotiate house. Negotiate in the house, and I'm like, just and just be neutral. Compliment it. D- anything that you don't like or or whatever, like Mental save note. it. Yep. Yeah, yep. <laughs> save it because yep. it you man, so many mistakes are made there. Okay, know the seller's needs and be flexible with them. Number eight, waiving due diligence and or earnest money non refundable after due diligence deadline. Yeah. So, so this one you got to be careful with. This goes back to that due diligence, and I th- we'll just touch briefly on this. You can get into a point where you go under contract and you can say, hey, after due diligence, our earnest money is hard. Like we're guaranteed, we know we're going to get this loan or your cash. So it gives that confidence of a seller to pick you because no matter what you do, they're going to take your earnest money. Whether you buy the house, great. Yeah. If you drop out, they get a five ten thousand dollar well encumbrance. You can you can get so creative with due diligence and your earnest money. You can say, hey, upon acceptance of this offer, we'll make five hundred dollars non refundable of our earnest money. A thousand dollars non refundable. Mm-hmm. Just to like, if you accept us, we can still back out for due diligence, right? But you would get a portion of that earnest money non refundable upon acceptance, and you can make different trigger points. You can do it upon acceptance, after due diligence, and then obviously, earnest money is always non refundable after financing and appraisal deadline. So right. it doesn't make sense to make it any longer than that. So just by like tightening up the dates on or the deadlines on when. Part, some, or all of the earnest money is is made non-refundable. non-refundable can make a big difference. And there is a spot in the Repsi, it's 8.3 BI, that talks about buyer's right to cancel before the financing and appraisal deadline, but after due diligence, where you can put in there X amount of dollars to be non-refundable after due diligence. Mm-hmm. And so it's right in there in the Repsy. If you wanted to put it in there, hey, after our due diligence, we want a thousand dollars non-refundable after due diligence, and that just makes you stand out mm-hmm. a little bit more. And, and you could even do just the opposite. You could actually add more. Hey, we went non-refundable after due diligence. We'll we'll give even more non-refundable. There's right. Another section in there where you can actually add upon yeah, more, add. Due, more due diligence mm-hmm. or more earnest money. Right. Yep. So and I've never flexible. I've never really used that. Um, Most because most clients just put, you know, the full amount of earnest money and then just different triggering points on when it becomes non-refundable. But you can definitely be like, hey, after this, we'll add additional earnest money, another ten grand or whatever, if you wanted to. So your earnest money and making a portion of that refundable at different points is a very good strategy to making your offer more appealing. I I always like like there's a lot of properties I bought where I would gladly be like, hey, just to to play and have the option to buy this property, I would give a thousand bucks, you know? Oh, yeah. And if I if I don't buy it, like that you keep the thousand bucks and it's like within a week you'll know. Like that's a great strategy, right? Within For a sure. week you'll know or two weeks and I'll 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 pay to play, you know. Right. It's a gamble. Basically. Yeah, yeah. A smaller gamble. Yeah. Well and, and, and then there's times to a lot of people that are flipping houses or Young couples that know this house is going to need DIY, a thousand bucks is an easy out if there's, you know, foundation problems right. or huge things. But other than that, you pretty well know that you're going to go in and fix this house. You know, you're going to do bathrooms, you know, you're going to do kitchen upgrades. So mm-hmm. it's a, it's a pretty easy slash alluring, not gimmick or trick, but essentially bait for you to take my offer. Right. But yeah. that you're willing to walk away from if it's going to cost you an extra hundred on a big deal. Right. So, yeah. Okay. And then second to last, uh, escalation clause and appraisal floor and ceiling. So we'll cover the escalation clause first. This is basically goes back to the offer price. Sometimes there's multiple offers and buyers are like, well, I don't know exactly how much we want to offer, but I don't want to go up to my max that I'm willing to offer. So there's what's called an escalation clause where we'll say 500,000 is the asking price and they're willing to go up to 550. You could say, hey, we're willing to pay you 500,000 is the offer price. But if there's higher competing offers, we're willing to beat any of those competing offers by one, two, three, four, five thousand dollars up to 550, right? So if they got another offer for 530 
and you said would be any other competing offer by five thousand up to five fifty, that puts you at five thirty five. And that and that automatically goes. So that gets kind of spooky, but usually you have to be presented with that contract. Yeah. Right? They have to prove to you that they've got that offer and they right. can't just go, Oh yeah, we've got a five forty five offer. You know, 550 is the max. So. Yeah. A lot of times you say in proof of other competing offer it has to be shown yeah, and it has length. to be an arm, arm's length transaction. So I've, I've still heard of agents being like, oh, if I get an escalation clause, I'm counting, countering to the max because you just showed us your cards. But I've never had that happen. And I've done it a lot of times. Well, and, and it depends on the market. Right now, I wouldn't. If you pulled that card at a buyer, myself personally. Right. If I did an escalation clause to try to be competitive and you just went... We don't have any other offers, but we want your full max. I just be like, well, bye. You know, unless they really wanted the house, the well, buyers. Yeah, yeah, but you know, at that point, when you're doing escalation clauses, that's really competitive. At that point, there is other offers. There should be, or you your know, agent isn't doing a very yeah, good job. He's, he's exposed <laughs> you. You know, he or she's exposed you at that point. So keep in mind, it's not always a good idea just to pull out all these tricks. No, if they know the situation. Yeah, if there's no other competing offers, just. You know, going with the strong offer, quick look, quick turnaround time on yep. the repsy, and and see if you can get it tied up. And then if you hear of other offers coming in, you know, slide another one in. Yep. Say, hey, I know you're reviewing multiple offers now. We want to slide this addendum into ours, and you yep. can add to it. And then the other one is the appraisal floor or ceiling, which there's a whole addendum to this as well that basically says. In the event the property appraises for less than the purchase price, but equal to or more than blank. So let's go back to the $500,000 example. And the reason the appraisal addendum is important is if you have a seller and they price their house competitively at 500,000, cause that's where the comparable sales say it's worth. Mm -hmm. And you're offering above that, they might not feel inclined to take an offer that's above that because they are worried about appraisal issues. And right. if you can't get the financing, then you're out, right? Right. If the bank says, hey, it's not worth that, then you're done for. So what this appraisal guarantee basically says, you can say, hey, I'm willing to pay X amount, say 550. And if it appraises for anything less than 550, then I will cover up the difference. So if it, let's say the appraises for 525, then that buyer is basically saying they'll come up for, with 25 grand in cash to pay the, dif, the, the to difference. Offset for the loan mm -hmm. value, yep. And if it appraises for less than that appraisal floor, or sorry. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah the appraisal, so you can put in a thing, hey, I'm willing to pay $25,000 above appraisal price, or, or, mm -hmm. right? So if that came back in at four seventy five and you're at five twenty five, there's it's too big of a span. At that point, you know, you you you've put in a stop loss essentially. Right. Yep. You're not gonna have to come up with a hundred grand or lose your earnest. It's an appraisal floor. And this is where your your team comes in, right? We're gonna know, we're gonna pull comps and we're gonna give you a decent area. Mm -hmm. If we overshot or whatnot, great, because we put in that stop loss that you're not gonna be out of pocket, right? Mm -hmm. But we're gonna be able to give you a good window to know what you're doing. Right. Yeah. Cause for some buyers, like maybe their appraisal floor is only like, they only have five grand extra that they could pay out of pocket. So mm -hmm. in this case they would put their, like, I'm, I'm okay to, to pay up to four forty five, but if it's anything less than that, like I either have to back out or we got to drop the price. I'll pay up to five grand in the event of a low appraisal, but that's it basically. Right. Yeah. And, that, and this kind of goes in with that on your last one. Uh, you can waive your financing and appraisal contingencies. Yeah, what do we think about that? I, you know what? I, I've I've seen it happen, usually only with cash offers, right? And it goes back to your team again. Have you pulled me comps? Can Have I, as an agent, given you as a buyer the confidence, showed you other sales, you're not going to be overpaying? That's about the only time I would really suggest a financing and appraisal contingencies. Or, or if somebody's so cash heavy on the deal and they're like, we don't care. We want it. We have 300 grand cash from the seller yeah. at home. Other than that, that you get in trouble here. Yeah, you Because if the bank says, hey, no, we can't give you the money, you're just SOL. There's no right. remedy to that. Right. And I would, I would put waiving due diligence down here as well. Like I would waive financing and appraisal depending on how much money you had. 
before I waive due diligence. I think right. just waiving due diligence is completely crazy. Like that's like waving, like basically when you make the offer, you're like, I will for sure buy the property. You right. Know? And I've seen it happen, but I've done it. Yeah. But, but knowing that I was going to go in and no matter what, got the property. Yep. Yeah. And I, I knew. Right. So there was nothing I went on my, but there's still risks that you inherited, right? Yeah. Like you didn't know the septic, right. for example. Yeah. yeah. You know, we had to redo a septic, but the, if the price is right, that, you know, yeah, it's hard. It's hard to do it safely. Yeah. So we're always, um, there's a, there's all these other approaches that you can do before you have to waive due diligence or financing and appraisal. And sometimes I've seen people waive financing and appraisal contingencies and they just do everything within due diligence period and try and bust everything out super quickly. Again, they're different deadlines and it doesn't really relate because it's not material, but I've seen buyers try and get an appraisal done within the due diligence period really quick just right. to see if they can get through that quickly, you know? Right. So there's options here. There's ways that you guys can be more creative and... And any combination of all of these. I mean, right. it, it can get it can get squirrely back and forth when you get into multiple offer situations. But the first like seven were very, like anybody can apply those. You don't have to have a tons of money and like you can just be smart and be prepared is well, the biggest I, thing. I think like when we were getting ready to do this, I we were talking, be prepared, know your stuff, know the offer price and know the value. Mm -hmm. Time is of the essence and know your seller. Mm -hmm. Whether it's multiple offer or not, you do those four things. Seven. Or, well, I, I counted like on three different hands. And <laughs> jumped around. Basically, just oh, being, gotcha. being prepared is the number one best thing. Yeah. Because then you can, you can dispatch all these other strategies at any point. Yeah. If you're not prepared, you can't be prepared overnight. Right. You know, I can, I can send an addendum in a matter of 20, 30 minutes, mm -hmm. the second we, we decide to do something. I can't get you a pre-approver. I can't pay off a credit card or I right. can't get you another five grand down. Yeah. That same, you know. Or sell your house. Yeah, or sell your house or get pictures done. Right. You know, if you've got a list or, you know, stuff like that, let's be prepared. Yeah. Let's have all that stuff ready to go, so. Yeah. And there, are, there is a lot, of, like one thing that we didn't dive into here is just like going over terms, but this goes into like getting prepared. Like, hey, can you do cash? Can you do conventional FHA, seller financing? Can you do a HELOC on your house? Like how can you get com competitive with your financing and your terms? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and know what's available to you. So it's, again, it just, a lot of this comes down to knowing your position, being prepared, and then being able to deploy those strategies depending on the seller's needs. So hopefully you guys found this insightful and uh, helps you get a house. Let's do it. I love you.